I, I, I could follow almost all the all the the talks uh, since uh, Andreas and Nathanael uh, um, uh, a month or two ago. I don't know. It was a very long period anyway. And uh, and so uh, today uh, we will tell you about uh, topological phase transitions and in particular about uh, uh, a new look uh, on these uh, phase transition. And this is a joint work with uh, Avelio Sepulveda, who is still in Lyon for a couple of months, maybe more if there is a, still a lockdown in Chile, but he will get back to Chile uh, starting in September. Okay, so the first, uh, <clears throat> this first uh, part will be more uh, an introduction on the topic. And uh, at the end of this introduction, I will try to at least introduce the the main question we focused on, so that Avelio will then explain to you uh, what it is about. So, uh, just in one slide, uh, topological phase transitions they arose in the in the in the seventies, and they were discovered by uh, um, three physicists, which were Kosterlitz, Taules, but also Berezinski, in the early seventies. And uh, Alden, Kostelets, and Taules, they received the Nobel Prize in 2016 for uh, uh, how topology can be relevant to uh, properties of matter or for phase transitions. So Taules got it for two things, and Kostelets got it with Taules for the particular topological phase transitions. And uh, I'm not at all an expert on how it arises in uh, real systems, but I looked at uh, the Nobel Prize lecture and I, I, I took the following uh, keywords from, from what Kostelitz and Taules have written. And these topological phase transitions, they, they arise, for example, in those uh, uh, real world models, which are the superfluid films at very low temperature when you take helium films but also for thin films in superconductors. So here what is important is that we look at films. So these topological phase transitions will be very much of two dimensional nature. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> they also mentioned that it's uh, uh, highly related to two dimensional Coulomb plasma. And this is something we will see later in this talk today. And finally, I spotted this, uh, this uh, paragraph in their, in their Nobel lecture, where they say that surprisingly, they end up understanding that there was uh, also a reminiscence of these topological phase transitions uh, through a kind of duality for the roughening of crystal facets. And in fact, at the very end of uh, Avelio's talk, uh, I think he will get back to these uh, issues. Okay, so, uh, in this talk, uh, uh, there will not be any superfluid helium or anything like that. Most of the talk will uh, hold on a Z2 lattice, like that. So this will be my piece of Z2 lattice. And usually I will not be very precise, but if you want to think of the models to be well-defined, you can think of a finite box lambda n, which will be minus n n to the square which is a finite box inside Z2. Occasionally, but not much, I will talk slightly a little bit about Z4 to say that these topological phase transitions, they are not always restricted to two dimension. And this will be when I will mention abelian young mills model. But for most of the talk, we will be in Z2. And what we will do on each point on, of Z2 or, or each side of this box lambda n, which is a subset of Z2, we will attach a sign, a spin sigma of x, which will belong to a certain set that I will call S like that, but this is the only slide where I will use this notation. And this set in this uh, lecture will be either plus or minus one. So a very small set, a very small discrete set but it may also be the unit circle S1, which will involve some continuous symmetry. 
it may also be uh, may also have its values in in the real numbers r which has another continuous symmetry the translations and finally it may take its values into z so with some pictures it looks like that if the spin has its value in minus one one and recall we are on z2 what it corresponds to is the well-known easing model on which I will say a few words uh, in a couple of slides. The second model, I will spend more time on this one. The spins have their values in this unit circle and it's pictured here. And this is called either the planar rotator model or also the XY model. And in fact, this is probably the easiest statistical physics model where one can spot a topological phase transition then uh, uh, the spins may take their values in R. And in that case, it's a model that uh, has appeared many times in the previous talks uh, on the One World Policy Seminar. And this is called the Gaussian free field. And what, what is nice about this model is the G, is the fact this is a Gaussian model. And that means one can compute many things. And the last character in that talk will be the same thing as uh, uh, Gaussian free field, except we will restrict, we will condition it to take its values into Z. And usually in these cases, I will call it Psi instead of Phi to make the distinction. So the last model is maybe a bit less uh, common. You may call it either an integer valued Gaussian free field. It's also called a Z ferromagnet. Why? Because it's a little bit like an easing model, but the spin of the easing model, instead of taking only the values plus or minus one, they can take any integer value. And once we see those spin systems, what we do in statistical physics is that we define a probability measure on those spaces. And these probability measures are called either Boltzmann measures or Gibbs measure, which is written here. And uh, these measures, they depend on a, let me change the color. They depend on a, on a parameter, which is very important, which is this beta here. And this beta is called an inverse temperature. So you should think of it as one over T, where T is usually more intuitive, is the temperature. So this Gibbs measure, the probability of a configuration sigma so by probability, if you are in the discrete case on a finite box, this is very easy to give uh, sense to that. If you are in the continuous case, you should think of it as a radon nicodym derivative with respect to a Lebesgue measure on all of the, or a uniform measure on the circle here on, on all the, the sides. So this probability measure will be proportional uh, on all sigma to these weights, which are exponential minus this inverse temperature beta times a kind of gradient term, a Dirichlet energy, which is there to say that uh, if your system is very disordered, it will have large gradients everywhere in space. So we, it will have a very high energy and the Boltzmann weight will make that configuration unlikely. It will be exponential minus beta times this high energy if the gradients are very large. And so here one can see the effect of the inverse temperature. If beta is very, very large, in other words, if the temperature T is very, very small, you, 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 you put a very small weight to the configuration that are too demanding in energy, that have too large gradients. And the effect of that is that if I take the XY model in Z2, so spins are in S1, when beta will be very, very large, the system will look slightly random, but very much ordered. And we'll get back to it later. On the other hand, if the inverse temperature is very small or the temperature is very large, so this beta, even among experts, it's, it's always source of confusion. I, myself, I often get confused, but I will more use beta than T. If beta is very small, in the extreme case, you could think of beta to be even zero, which is the infinite temperature case. In that case, the, the Gibbs measure is basically a uniform measure on all the possible configuration. And what you see is a system which is very disordered. And in some sense, the, the, 
the point of statistical physics is to try to understand how the system changes when you change the, the temperature or when you change the beta and to see that uh, the system uh, has drastic changes and sometimes critical points. So in the next slide, I will focus on maybe the easiest of these cases, which is the Gaussian free field. And in most of the talk, I will focus on these two models that turn out to be dual to each other, which is the, uh, uh, so, so which is the, the XY model and the integer value GFF. Those two models will be the one that will have in some sense a topological phase transition. And the point of the talk at the end, and it will be more in Avelio part, will be to say that in fact, this Gaussian free field, which at first sight doesn't go through any kind of phase transition, will also catch uh, the Rizitsky Kosselet's Taulet transition, but the more subtle one, it will be a transition from the point of view of a statistical recovery problem. So let's start with the first character, which is this Gaussian free field. So here, uh, as in the previous slide, the, the, the probability of a configuration or the, the radon nicodym derivative of a configuration is this exponential minus beta over two times the sum of the gradient square. So one way to picture this system, here I can put boundary condition which are zero, or here also, zero boundary conditions or if you prefer, it's also called Dirichlet boundary conditions. One way to picture this system in dimension two is to think of edges as uh, little springs and to imagine that this is a kind of two dimensional bed which is attached at zero uh, along the bed. And then you put some energy into this two dimensional bed and you ask yourself, how does it fluctuate? And the higher beta is, the less energy you put in your energy. The smaller beta is, the harder you push on your bed and you look how it fluctuates. And in some sense, this quadratic form here is exactly the potential energy that this family of spring would create. Yeah. So if you simulate what is the Gaussian free field, uh, I didn't do it myself, I've stolen this on the web. It looks like this, uh, random field that is on the right on a, on a, on a box 20 by 20. And the, the nice feature of this thing is that vector? it's a Gaussian vector. So if you have an n by n grid, you end up with a Gaussian vector in R to the n squared because you have n squared points in the middle. Christophe, yes. uh, it seems that the people cannot see if you write uh, down there where you write the R n square. Ah, okay, uh, okay, so may maybe it's because of this thing of Zoom. Yeah, that we... yeah, in some versions of, of Zoom, it's very difficult to get, uh, get, to get okay. rid of it. Okay, so I'll, I'll, tr I'll try my, my best not to go below that line. Uh, in some slides, I'm afraid it's going, I'll do my best, thanks. Okay. So, uh, so it, it's a Gaussian vector. So in particular, it's not too hard to compute what is the variance of the Gaussian random variable that sits in the middle here. And uh, you can check that the variance of phi lambda n in zero for the inverse temperature beta, this is going to be equivalent as n goes to infinity to log n and if you wish, there is a constant which is one over two pi times beta. So it makes sense that beta is in the denominator, denominator because if beta is very large, it means the temperature is very low and it makes sense that the fluctuation is smaller. But what you should remember from that formula is that from the point of view of phase transition, there is not much happening when you change the parameter beta. There is no phase transition, it's just a scaling effect, not more. Okay, so, so maybe remind for the rest of the talk that since the variance is logarithmic, the typical fluctuation here are square root log n here. So this random field, this bed in the middle fluctuates like square root of log n. So in this one slide, I just 
found some pictures of the easing model in Z2. On the left, the temperature T is very large or the beta is very small and the system is very disordered. On the right, the temperature T is very small, so it's very close to what is called the ground state and beta is very large. And we see here that this system is what one called long, there is long range order. In other words, here the system has chosen to be in the plus one state and it's in the plus one state all, all across the plane. There are some islands that disagree with being in the plus one state, but they're very tiny and they do not break this long range order. And in between, in between we have the beta C or the, or the TC if you prefer. And here we have something uh, which has nice uh, pictures. It's a, it's a critical point. I will get back to it later. Uh, there were many works in the last 20 years by, uh, by uh, Smirnov, Shelkak uh, that uh, also used the uh, uh, SLE processes that were invented by Schramm and, and so on. And this critical point can be computed, uh, was computed by Onzager as the following value here. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, uh, recall that there are very nice curves here that separate a phase from another. And for example, here it's a theorem that such curves converge to SLE3. And this is a theorem by Shelkak and Smirnov. Okay, so in the next slide, I want to explain to you just in one slide very quickly, how come there is a long range order when there is this discrete symmetry of plus and minus one um, in the case of the easing model. The reason why there is such a long range order behavior at small temperature is called the payers argument. So imagine that the system has been prepared at infinity or in a huge box with plus spins on the boundary. My pluses should be in blue, it would be better, but think of this as being blue. And you may ask yourself, what's the probability that by the time you reach the bulk or by the time you reach the middle of that box, what is the probability that the Gibbs measure that I introduced before has changed his mind and has put a minus spins here in the middle? And the, 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 the Payol's argument will tell you the following in the presence of this discrete symmetry. If you want to change your mind by the time you reach the bulk, it needs to be the case that you will find an interface gamma, this gamma here, which will have pluses in the exterior and minuses in the inside. It may be the case that you will have three of these or five of these, but you need to have at least one of these. And the point of Payol's argument is to say that any such interface gamma has a big energy cost. It has an energy cost, which is given by exponential minus beta times gamma. And when beta is large, when the temperature is low, this is a huge cost because along all the edges, there is a disagreement which costs exponential minus beta. And the point of Payol's argument is a combinatorial argument which tells you that there are not so many possible interfaces to go ar around the orig origin, there are exponentially many. But the exponential rate when beta is large enough will be beaten by this energy cost and it will be very hard. And this is the reason for the long range order. I will not say more, but I will go to the uh, XY model now, to the case where the spins uh, take their values in the unit circle S1. So here it's a, it's a simulation by Demidov um, I, that I have also stolen on the web. And here you have to think uh, that on, on each, so the red is not very good here. Let me take another color. On each point here, here there is a point X in Z2. And on that point X in Z2, we assign a sigma X, which is in this unit circle S1. And this simulation by Demidov is nice because on each point X in Z2, he has colored a pixel in dimension two, 
depending on the angle of the spin sigma x at that point x, and the color is given here. So you have this kind of a, a colored TV screen now, and this is the case of very large temperature. So it makes sense that the picture looks very much disordered. Now, if you make the temperature uh, going down like that, uh, you start having nice pictures, even though I cheated a little bit here because this is a Markov chain and I stopped the Markov chain a little bit before equilibrium to have a nicer picture, I'm sorry. Uh, but in the large scale, pictures should look like that. And what you see is a, is a very nice piece of art, but you also see that uh, uh, there is no long range order. So long range order, even if T here is very small, is not, is not there. Why? Because uh, uh, long range order would correspond to a system where all the spins would agree to a certain direction and would fluctuate just a little bit around that chosen direction on the whole Z2. In Z3, if you were to do the same model in Z3, you would have such a long range order. But in dimension two, that's not the case. And the reason why you do not see such a long range order is due to the following effects. Imagine, as we did with the payers argument, that you prepare your system with, uh, with spins that are pointing towards east everywhere on a huge box like that. This is a picture by Berenik. And you ask yourself, by the time you reach the bulk, what is the probability that the spin in the middle has uh, changed its mind and is now pointing towards west? It's, it's no longer the case that you will necessarily find an interface gamma as before, which will have a huge energy cost. This is not true anymore. And the, the real reason here is that there is, it's not a discrete symmetry anymore. It's now a continuous symmetry and you can make things in a, in a more peaceful way from the boundary all the way to the, to the bulk. And I leave you as an exercise one for those who want to, to practice a little bit those things, that you can achieve this, you can find a function and it's called a spin wave. You can assign uh, angles to the points in this domain in such a way that the energy cost and what I call here an energy cost, it would be a Dirichlet energy of uh, this configuration sigma, which is defined as the sum over the neighboring sites of sigma i minus sigma j squared. You can find such a spin wave, such a particular smooth way of changing the angle in such a way that this energy cost will be less than one over log n with a certain multiplicative constant if this is an n by n box. In other words, with a very tiny energy cost, you can change your mind from the boundary to the, to, to the bulk. A hint for the exercise is that you can, in fact, the optimal way to do that is to seek for, a, for, a, for a, the, ap the appropriate harmonic extension uh, of this angle and this angle here on the boundary. So with this very little, uh, uh, energy cost, you can show, in fact, that there is never long range order. And this was a theorem by Mermin Wagner, which, wa which was proved in the 60s in the context of quantum spin systems, but then extended to these classical spin systems. Okay, so, <clears throat> so there is no long range order. And so I guess in the 60s, after this discovery of Mermin Wagner, people thought that from the point of view of phase transitions, probably the XY model is a boring model in dimension two. But that's where uh, Berezinski, Kostolets, and Taules come into the game. They said, yes, indeed, there is never long range order. The only place where you may find long range order in this system would be the zero temperature here. In the zero temperature, you have infinitely many ground states but they are perfectly aligned like that. So ground states are ordered, but it's a kind of a degenerate case. And what Berezinski, Kostolets, and Taules noticed is that 
there is a more subtle phase transition, and we will see that it's a topological kind of phase transition, which is as follows. At high temperature, the way the system looks here and the way the system looks there is basically completely independent from each other. There is exponentially decay, there is exponential decay of correlation between that corner and that corner. And this can be quantified as follows. The two points correlation function of this system, the scalar product of the spin X at the bottom left and the spin Y at the upper corner right is exponentially small. Its expectation is exponentially small in the distance. So this is another nice exercise, uh, a bit more difficult, but it's a standard step in statistical physics to prove something like that. But what they notice, and which is remarkable, I will spend quite some time on this, is that as the temperature shrinks, at some point it crosses this threshold here, below which the two-point correlation function are now uh, power low. They are polynomially decaying. And this, in, in, in statistical physics, we like because power law correlation functions are a sign of criticality. So in fact, in that case, we have a whole bunch of critical models. All these are critical models in the same way as a critical easing model at the, at the precise on dagger temperature is a critical model. So this whole line of models they all carry different exponents. They all depend on what is the temperature, but you have this whole bunch of different critical models. And another great feature of this phase transition is that phase transitions, they're classified uh, as a first order if there is a kind of discontinuity uh, at, uh, of the free energy, a second order if you have to go to the uh, second derivative and so on. For example, percolation in dimension three is conjectured to be a phase transition of second order. And this nice topological phase transition is a C infinity order, is a phase transition of infinite order. So for the specialist, it means that the, the free energy is analytic here. The free energy is analytic here. And the only place where you would spot uh, subtlety would be here. But here, the free energy would be C infinity. So from the eyes of the physicist, it needs very good eyes to spot that there is a phase transition. Okay, so I, I want to spend uh, uh, a little bit of time to, to give you the point of view of uh, Berezinski, Kosterlitz, and Taules. How did they, uh, uh, how did they uh, find that there is such a striking phase transition? It goes as follows. So here I will imagine that we are in the very low temperature region. Um, so beta, I will think of it as being very high. And so here, so this is the, this is the Gibbs weight for the XY model. By straightforward trigonometry, this scalar product gives rise to this cosine between theta i and theta j. And if beta is very, very large, it means you are, you are almost ordered. It means your spin system is more or less like that. So of course, there will be places where there will be large gradients, but they will be rare. So you can imagine that uh, this approximation is not too far from the truth, namely that you can Taylor expand the cosine because in most places, theta i and theta j are very close. And so if you, if you have good faith, you do the Taylor expansion and what you end up with is basically exactly the Gaussian weight we had before. It's exactly the quadratic form that we had before and you end up with a Gaussian free field. So it's almost a Gaussian free field, but not quite because a Gaussian free field, it would be theta i with values in R and here we are integrating over theta i, which have values in zero to pi. And in some sense, the fact we have a compact space here makes a big difference and is the reason for the topological phase transitions here in some sense. And so I will go a little bit quickly on that because we will not need this later, but the right point of view, and this, is, this was understood by uh, BKT, by these three physicists, is to view 
this uh, Gibbs weight as a Gibbs weight on the one forms on R2. Why? Because it's in the Gibbs weight, it's, it's, a, it's a, a gradient field on the one forms. You only need to know how the, 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 the angle field moves from one side to another, but you don't really care to know where it is modulo 2 pi. So, so then what they, they notice is that if you look for a statistical physics model on the one forms on R2, so recall that the one form is something that uh, you can integrate your one form along a path in R2. One forms, they can arise from zero forms. It will be the only slide with a little bit of a, a differential forms. And uh, they can come from the zero forms, which we like, they're just functions on R2. And in some sense, the contribution in this uh, Gibbs measure from the zero forms is exactly the contribution from the Gaussian free field. And the more subtle contribution to this model is coming from the two forms via the co-derivative the, or the Hodge derivative. And the contribution from the two forms are given by those pictures here, which are called vortices. Okay, so what I want to do in the next slide is I just want to give you another exercise, a little bit like in the spin wave, which is to compute what is the energy cost of trying to put one vortex into the system. So let's imagine that you have, uh, you have this n by n box. So this is an n by n box in Z2. Christophe? Yes? So people are um, asking whether the, the Synfinity phase transition is proved uh, rigorously or not. Okay, so I, I see a little bit uh, some things here. So, so I think the story is that Frölich Spencer, as pointed out by Jean-Christophe Moura, they, 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 they managed to understand quite well the low temperature phase of this model. But, uh, but not at all, all the way to the critical point. And if you would want a, a, a rigorous result for the XY model, this is not known for the, I mean, the C infinity transition. But the closest results to that would be a result by Pierre Luigi Falco, which is not on the XY model, but it's called the sine Gordon model or the, or the dilute uh, Coulomb gas. And when you make, uh, when you make some, slight simplification to these models, you can do a very efficient renormalization group analysis where you are very close to proving such results. But on the XY model, mass-wise, uh, no, there is, there is no results like that. So if you have a finite box in Z2, so here you have to think that you have the sides of Z2 here, which carry a spin in S1. Exercise two, you can ask yourself, what is the energy cost of a vortex? And I claim that the energy cost now is going to be constant times log n. So remember that the spin wave, the energy cost was one over log n. A vortex is much more costly. This is going to be C times log n. And a hint for this exercise is that you can look at this dyadic annually. So kind of two to the K, two to the K plus one. And in that annually, if you are at distance two to the K, the gradient between two neighboring points along a circle of, of a diameter two to the K, you will make tiny increments of about two pi over two to the K. So the increments are basically two pi over two to the K. And so the, the, the Dirichlet energy is going to sum these increments, which are 2 pi over 2 to the k squared. Okay. Uh, and, and how many points do I have in this annulus? I have about 2 to the k squared points. So what it means is that the energy cost of this dyadic annulus is roughly 1. But the same arguments will say that the energy cost of this other data can really is also going to be one. And in this picture, you can stick roughly log n such data can really, so the cost is going to be log n times a constant. And in fact, you can even compute that constant and you can recover 
all the heuristics from Berezinsky calls toilet towers. The exercise three, in the beginning there were not exercises, but then I found out that I didn't have enough time, but they're nice exercises, is that when you want to put one vortex with zero boundary conditions, in fact, you are forced to put an anti-vortex somewhere else. And the energy cost of doing this at distance L, it's easy to see that it's also C times log L. In some sense, there is C over two log L here and C over two log L here. So what it means is that if you have your huge system here, your XY model here, the argument of Berezinsky cost less to less is as follows. If you would want to put one plus vortex and one minus vortex, the energy cost it has, if they are far away from each other, if they are macroscopically away from each other, say at distance n, the energy cost is going to be uh, exponential because there is the exponential weight minus beta c log n. But the number of ways to put these two vortices is n to the four times that. So you see that if beta is very, very large, this is too costly to put big vortices in the system. And they argued by such an entropic VS energy argument that for large beta, you do not see macroscopic vortices. In the jargon of Coulomb gas, you would say that you do not see free vortices. There is no plasma. And when the temperature gets larger, suddenly you have a unbinding of vortices. You start having a plasma. You start having these large scale vortices. So it was a bit fast, but on a picture, at small, at small temperature, I pictured in white, uh, let me take from black. I pictured in white uh, vortices that go in one direction. So for example, here they go in that direction. And I pictured in black vortices that go into the other direction. And what we're supposed to see here, so I made some mistakes in my uh, picture, but we're supposed to see that in some sense, vortices and anti-vortices, they like each other and they kind of paired to each other a little bit like in the talk we had last week by Ander Olroy. And when you make the temperature go to higher and higher value, at some point, this pairing of vortices collapses and you start having a plasma and that's really what the PK3 transition is about. Okay, so I will tell you a little bit about what uh, math mathematicians have been doing. So it, it relies on the last model that I introduced at the very beginning. I had the easing model, the XY model, the Gaussian free field, and I had this Z field of magnet or this integer valued GFF. So those pictures, they they do not represent typical instances of integer valued Gaussian free field. They're pictured, I think, by Eyal Lubetsky. They're more in the large deviation region, but what you should think of is it's still a fluctuating interface in dimension two, except the values it takes are restricted to be in a Z. So here, the probability at beta of a random function psi x x in some finite box is going to be proportional exactly like in the Gaussian free field minus beta over two sum over the neighboring sites in this n by n box of psi of i minus psi of j and the gradient squared. But there is an indicator function here that the psi of i are all in z for all i. And this makes a big difference because it means that when you are at very low temperature, if beta is very, very low, is very, very large, sorry, if beta is very large, then if you have integer value, then you want to make a, a little bit of gradient, you're forced to make a one gradient or a minus one or maybe even more. And this starts being very costly. So in fact, as opposed to the Gaussian case, this model, which is conditioned to live in the integers, will have a phase transition and this phase transition will also be of topological nature because it will be in bijection with the previous phase transition of the XY model. 
So the link between those two, I will explain the link without explaining the details. The story is a little bit long, but I will just tell you where it comes from. Uh, so the, 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 it, it goes as follows. So the, if you take the XY model, so you have, you have spins on vertices that are in S1, you can make a kind of Fourier transform of that model. And what you end up with is now after Fourier transform, and here I pass a lot of details, but we will not need those details here. You end up with a model which lives now on the dual graph, which lives here, and which assigns integer valued spins on those sides. So here we are in Z2 dual, but the nice feature here is that this is self-dual, so this is good. And on each of those spins, you have a psi of x, which lives in z, while on the left, we had a sigma of x, which was in the unit interval. And in some sense, it makes sense because the Fourier transform of the unit circle is indeed the integers z. So this is z. And, uh, and what you end up with here on the right, is an integer valued field, but it's not quite the integer valued Gaussian free field. It's still, it's still a gradient model, but it's not, uh, it's not the exponential of the gradient squared. It's slightly more complicated. It has to do with Bessel functions. If you want to get that integer valued Gaussian free field, you need to slightly change the XY model in something which is called the Villa model. <clears throat> so the Villain model is almost the same thing, except you do the following. In the XY model, the Gibbs measure was product over the neighboring sites of exponential minus B, exponential beta cosine theta i minus theta j. And what Villain has done is that he has replaced this interaction, this Gibbs measure, by almost the same thing i neighboring j of um, sum over m of exponential minus beta over two. So it's a kind of Taylor expansion. Ah, sorry. Theta i minus theta j. And there is a two pi m here squared. So the Villain model is a kind of Taylor expansion of xy, but it's also periodized. There is a periodization here. So if you want to view it, there is one way to view it like that, which is to say that here, here you can plug what is this periodic function of, of theta or of theta i minus theta j. And the function of the right, this periodized Gaussian is almost, when beta is very large, it's going to be basically the same thing. You would need really good eyes to see a difference. In other words, as beta goes to infinity, what you see is exactly the same thing as an XY model with a slightly different change. The very nice feature of this Villain model, I will write it on the top, is the Villain model. If you go through the same Fourier transform, this time it gives you really the integer, integer valued Gaussian free field. And you don't have to play with a, a Bessel function and things like that. So Froelich and Spencer, they've done everything, but it's slightly simpler to understand things in the Gaussian case. Okay, so the, 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 the work of Froelich and Spencer can be summarized as follows. They, 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 their, their, their big theorem from the early 80s is to prove this intuition that Berezinski, Kostolets, and Tules had. But they didn't do it uh, through this uh, uh, binding, unbinding of vortices, or it's, 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 it's in the picture, but it's a little bit hidden. What they did is they, they went through the Fourier, through the duality, 
And by the duality, there is a, a inversion of temperature, a little bit like when you take the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, you still have a Gaussian, but the sigma became a one over sigma. So here, if you have beta on the top, you, you have to think of one over beta. And in some sense, the dual model of the high temperature XY model is a very low temperature Z ferromagnet because of this inversion of temperature. And now, now that's why they managed to prove a theorem in some sense. They're back into a model which has a discrete symmetry. So, so if you wish, on the easy side, you can use Payer's arguments. Because in the low temperature regime, a Z ferromagnet doesn't want to create large gradients. It's too costly, so it will be very localized around the Dirichlet, around the zero Bandai condition. And when the temperature will shrink here, the temperature will shrink, in the above picture, temperature will get higher. And what they proved is that at some point, you cross a transition, and on the side of the integer value GFF, it's a localization on the right, there's the localization transition on the left. And they show that here, the fluctuation of the surface is again square root of log n, as you have in the, in the Gaussian case. Okay, so, and they proved more quantitative things. They proved that the two point correlation function is more or less the same as what you would guess from the Gaussian case, but they needed to have some correction to the Gaussian spin wave. Okay, so, so uh, before the end of the talk, the, the, the main message is in some sense the following. In most uh, statistical physics model in two dimension, when there is a discrete symmetry, a lot of nice uh, features have been proved in the last 20 years. So for example, as I mentioned before, here by the theorem of shell kax mirnov for the critical easing, you have an SLE3. Uh, for critical percolation by a, a theorem of Smirnov, you have convergence to an SLE6. And, and, and all those processes are also related to the work of Schramm from uh, uh, 1999. And if you would want to look at uh, Lou Perez random work or uniform spanning tree, you would have uh, Lawler, Schramm, and, and Werner that would prove that these converge to SLE8. And there are many other instances like uh, Gaussian free field and, 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 and all that. And the question we asked with Avelio is when you have a continuous symmetry, it's not, it's not quite clear where you would look for interfaces and what kind of macroscopic uh, fluctuating object you may extract from such pictures. And so we were thinking of what would be in natural interfaces here. And from the work we've done, it gives, it, it's not a proof, but it gives a, a large credit to the fact that these should converge to SLE4 curves in a precise sense, and Avelio will get back to it later. And the fact, uh, so the way to think of this is, is most justified by a, something which is still a conjecture, but it's a very nice conjecture by Frolich and Spencer in 83, where they say that if you, if you view this system as spins that live in the complex plane, uh, on each point X, you have a spin which is exponential I times the angle, then this complex field, they conjectured that it should be the, the same in low at large scales, should converge in low at large scales to the complex exponential of the Gaussian free field. And this is an object which is known as a Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And this is a well-defined object even in the continuum. And uh, Avelio will mention uh, results that appeared this morning by uh, Yuan Haru and Yane Yunila about that. And so they conjectured that uh, uh, at large scales, the Villa model should just be a, a Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And so the first result that we prove with Avelio, which will not be the focus of today, so I'll just mention it, is that we can show in a quantitative way that vortices contribute to, to the log fluctuations. In which sense? So we can show that the two point correlation function is less than what the Gaussian free field would give, 
but we have this non-perturbative additional effect here, which comes from the vortices. So notice that the froelich spencer theorem is a lower bound. It's something which says that this two-point correlation function is larger than what the Gaussian free field would give with a little correction. And from the physics point of view, the result of froelich spencer is more important because our upper bound would not prove a KT transition. So our work is more there to say what is quantitatively the effect of these plus and minus vortices. A consequence of this uh, uh, effect of the vortices that I will uh, go very quickly through it is about the dual model, the integer valued Gaussian free field. And last year, Matto verse could show that the maximum of the integer valued Gaussian free field is also constant times log n, like in the Gaussian case. And what we can show is that, and since the maximum of the Gaussian free field is a subject that has been very active in the last few years with relationships with branching, Brownian motions and all that, when you restrict it to live in the integers, we can show that the maximum sits quite below by a multiplicative constant below what it would be if you had a Gaussian field. If you try to solve this question in dimension one, it's almost trivial, but in dimension two, you need to understand the effect of the vortices. And uh, another thing, so this is more a work in progress, but it turns out that uh, there is a, another nice model where you have also um, topological defects and it's called Abelian Young Mill. So I'm not going to define too much the model, but at least it's a bit nice because it's no longer in dimension two. So it changes a little bit the scenery, it's in Z4. And in this model, I will not even uh, give you what is the Gibbs measure, but now the randomness is more naturally attached to the edges. And you put a, a group structure on all the uh, group element on each of these edges of Z4. And depending on the model you look at, if you are very um, brave, you will take as a group uh, SU2 or SU3. This is for uh, the problem of the confinement of quarks. If you're less brave, you will go into Abelian Young Mills, and this is what we looked at. And there were uh, many nice works along these lines. So it started by, by Froelich Spencer with U1 with the U1 group or the S1. And uh, in the last two years, there were uh, very nice works by Chatterjee, first Röhm, Lenels, and Viklund, and, and, and Chao, where they looked at ab abelian cases and finite groups. And here it's not, not necessarily abelian. And what we can do with Avelio is that there is a, uh, we can handle in some sense the case of a continuous gauge group, but the U1 is still abelian. And there, there is a phase transition again by Froelich Spencer, which say that above a certain temperature, the, the, there is a Wilson observable, which is going to be less than something minus constant area of gamma. So a Wilson observable is something that integrates these elements in the groups along a two dimensional rectangle. And at high temperature, it's not too hard to prove this. And what they show is that at low temperature, uh, the, there is a perimeter low, perimeter of gamma, less than the, the average Wilson observable. And this is a sign of, a, of a also, in fact, a topological phase transition somehow. And what we can show with Avelio is we can give a similar quantitative estimate on the role of kind of vortices in this continuous case. So here we, we have a kind of one over two pi beta and we have a exponential minus four beta Christoph. strengthening of what the Gaussian spin wave would give. Christoph? Yes? It's not clearly seen what you have written. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see if I can shift it. Okay. Yes, sorry, I forgot that. Well, let me say it in words. That that similarly, as in the case of the XY model, we can, we can prove quantitative bonds on the effect of topological defects in these four dimensional young mills, where topological defects now are, have a kind of geometry of uh, line vortices. 
so, but I won't say more about this. I think I should finish really soon. I guess I'm a bit late. So in, in the next talk, the, the main question Avelio will focus on will be the following. Remember that uh, Frolich and Spencer have conjectured that this picture should be exponential i one over square root of the effective temperature times phi, where phi here is a Gaussian free field of temperature one. I want to write it as exponential i t times phi. And uh, what we would want to understand is, can we recover if we observe this system, if we observe exponential i t phi, where phi is a Gaussian free field, can we recover from the observation of this complex field, can we recover phi on an n by n box say? And if you prefer, this is the same as the following. If you're given a Gaussian free field phi modulo two pi over t, Christophe, can you again, recover? Again, you are, Christophe? Ah, again, again. You are drawing to. I'm terrible. Sorry. Ah, let me do it here. If you're given phi modulo two pi over t, can you recover, it's the same question, the original Gaussian free field on your lattice? And he will do the one dimensional case. I will not do it here. He will show that it's related to shifted, uh, to, 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 to fields that live in shifted copies of the integer, uh, of the integers, but he will explain this in the next talk. And just in one word, I will not going to write anything because you're not going to see it again. What we will show is that in dimension one, it's very easy to see that there is not much interesting, but in dimension two, if you look at these fields modulo two pi over t, where t is huge, so if two pi over t is tiny here, then we will show that it's impossible to recover the fluctuating field. But at some point when t gets smaller, two pi over t gets larger, at some point, suddenly, we'll be able to recover the fluctuating field here. And remember that in the middle, the fluctuating field is something like square root of log n, so it's much larger than this two pi over t. And there will be a phase transition from the point of view of this reconstruction problem. And I will not go into the link with the SLE4, nor the reconstruction problems. Uh, it has to do with localization, delocalization of random interfaces in Z. And there were many works lately by other authors uh, uh, for such uh, type of random surfaces. Um, and let me just comment that in the continuum, Natal uh, Beresiki, uh, Scott Sheffield, and Shin Soon have recovered a phi out of a um, real uh, exponential of the Gaussian free field, which is something important in Uville quantum gravity. And the similar question, but now with a, with a phase, a complex exponential. Uh, this morning, Johan Aru and Yanne Yudila have uh, produced a paper which shows that it can be done also in the continuum, which complements what Avelio will say. So there the interest is that it gives better value of until where you can reconstruct the field. And the advantage of the discrete is that there is this nice PKT transition because you cannot give a meaning to this complex exponential above a certain value. Okay, so sorry, I was slightly too long. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Christophe. Uh, let me see. I think that uh, we more or less covered all the questions. Uh, Yeah, I did not manage at all to follow the the. But it's okay because it's it's not supposed to be your work. Uh, it's 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 more my work than your work to follow the, the questions in the chat. And uh, so I think I, so. The, we should start like immediately, but um, probably it's better to have like a. Uh, three minutes break or something like that to go and get something from the uh, from the kitchen and um, so and Avelio will will uh, it will go more slowly than I was in the last uh, 
15 minutes. So, it, that's, yeah. so the last few good. slides that were very fast, it's already...